I'm Eva, and I would like to welcome you to another episode of The Charm of It, a podcast for knitters who share my fascination with the nitty-gritty details of our craft. If you're a returning viewer, it's so nice to see you again. And if you're a new viewer, I'm glad you found your way to my little corner of YouTube. I record two different types of episodes, and today is going to be the one with more segments. So in addition to talking about finished objects, I will be reviewing a yarn, um... And introducing a new segment, which is going to be called Schrodinger's Sweater. Hopefully I pronounce that in a slightly passable voice. I don't know why I do this to myself. Anyway, I think it will be a fun segment. And then, I can't remember if I have any questions to answer. Probably not, because I haven't been using the Ravelry group a lot. But I have had a couple questions about socks on Instagram. And since two of my finished objects are socks, I will be incorporating that into the discussion. So, let's get started. Uh, my first finished object chronologically is the only one that was for me. This is my fanciful scarf, which was knit out of one skein of, I can't remember, hang on, let me check. Usually I always know what yarn I'm using, but this was an impulse buy at my former local yarn store a couple years ago. And Interlacements Dyer's Choice in Lace, and the colorway is the Renaissance. So when you saw this last, it had not been blocked yet, or, or finished, but <laughs> blocking really changed it. Okay, that's the right side. Uh, it about doubled in length, which is really nice. And I had always planned to block the garter stitch as hard as I could because I thought it would look neat. But what I hadn't thought about was the fact that once the garter stitch opened up, the pooling from the variegated yarn became much more obvious. So that was a little disappointing. But luckily, unlike a sweater, a scarf you wear kind of mushed up around you. So once I actually wear it and fluff it out, then you don't see the pulling nearly as much, so. I feel like this always takes much more time when I'm doing it on camera. So that's how I plan to wear it. And while I don't think I'll be buying much more variegated yarn in the future, I am pleased with how this turned out, and it's neat to have so many uh, of my favorite colors or colors that are in my wardrobe a lot in the scarf. It tends to show up a bit more vibrant on the camera, although I've noticed that the way the colors look on the screen when I'm recording is not the way they look when I get them on my computer, so I'm going to just stop worrying about that. But it has navies, it has burgundy plum colors, teals, and then a few little pops of that brighter aqua. And I designed this pattern myself. Uh, it's just mainly garter stitch, and then it's got these fun little bobbly fringe bits. So, pleased with how that turned out. I have noticed, as I've been diving into the world of scarf knitting, that lace weight scarves produce quite a thin fabric, and so while it would be nice for autumn and spring here, it's probably going to be too thin for winter. If I still lived in South Texas, it would be the perfect weight for winter. But I think that fingering weight and up is still going to be my go-to for winter scarves. But I really like, it took a little under a thousand yards, which was the whole skein. I just knit it from one end and then I knit, I, I was supposed to do till I was halfway through, but I ended up doing two thirds. And then I knit the other end and I grafted them together somewhere in the middle. Let's see if I can find it. It was in one of the garter stitch sections. I can't find it. My grafting must have gotten better. And you can really see that pulling there. I did alternate. I divided the skein in half and then knit two rows of each color. And I pulled them from opposite ends, which was all of the advice of my helpful knitting friends on Instagram who use variegated yarn more than me. But it definitely still had a tendency towards pooling. I really like how it looks in the bobbly, elongated stitch bits, though. I think that that really helped show off those short color repeats. And I did use blocking wires on this, which I only recently bought. I bought them from Knit Picks, and they're just the rigid ones. I thought about getting flexible ones. However, 
since I plan to mainly knit rectangular scarves, I was worried, and especially since I like to block pretty hard, I was worried that if I got the flexible ones, it would take more pins to keep that straight edge. And the whole point of buying blocking wires for me was to dramatically shorten how long I needed to spend pinning out the scarf because I have chronic illnesses and that kind of elaborate blocking is really hard on me. So what I did was to block it was I folded it in half because uh, I don't quite have enough blocking mats to do it full length. And then I just really quickly ran the wires through the sides, probably about an inch, two and a half centimeters at a go. There was no, it was not like super neat or anything, but I still think that the edges turned out pretty nice. I mean, you can see they're not perfectly straight, but when you wear it, that's not noticeable at all. And it was so easy and quick to block this. As I said, within an inch of its life, it was like up above the mat because I pulled it so taut, which meant it dried really quickly. I don't think it even took 24 hours to dry because it was getting so much air circulation. And then for the bottom edge, I had put these random eyelets in the ruffles when I was still trying to decide what my design was going to be, and then I just never took them out. So this proved perfect for the blocking wires. I could just thread them through each eyelet and then spread that out. So perhaps I will include eyelet in future scarves just for that reason. So yeah, this is 100% merino yarn, but so far it seems to be keeping the block well. And as I said, I doubled the length of it and without losing any of the width. So really happy about that. And I'm sure I will be wearing it a lot when the weather cools off. We had a wonderfully cool autumnal day a couple of days ago and I got to wear it for the first time. Next up is a pair of socks, and these are a gift knit. They are not for me, which you might be able to tell because they are fluorescent orange. Uh, they don't quite glow in real life, but that's pretty close to an accurate color. This is out of Knit Pick Stroll in the Hot Tamale colorway, which I believe is being discontinued. It was on deep discount. And I am knitting these for a biology friend of mine biologist, I should say, and I really liked how the pattern looked kind of sciencey to me. This is a free pattern from Knitty called the Nemesis Socks after the Agatha Christie Miss Marple book. And I knit the 72 stitch sock, whoops, now I have it backwards, for my friend who wears a men's size 11 shoe. And that seemed to have worked out really well. I wanted to talk briefly about how I decide what size to knit when I'm doing gift socks. So the first thing I do is, unless I want to get very elaborate measurements, which I really only do if I'm knitting stranded color work socks, in all other cases, I get their shoe size. And then I go to a the chart that's in Sensational Knitted Socks. There's also one in Custom Socks that tells you, but I use the Sensational Knitted Socks one. And it tells you basically the width and length of uh, feet that wear that size shoe. And then what I do is I take about an inch, so then um, I multiply that by my assumed gauge. I always assume I'm going to get eight stitches per inch when I'm knitting socks. And then I take 10% off for the circumference. So if, for example, someone's shoe size indicated they had 10 inch, a 10 inch circumference feet, I would multiply that by eight and get 80, and then I would take 10%, which is just you take off that last number. So then I would take eight stitches off and end up with a 72 stitch sock, which I think his feet were gonna be about 10 inches. So then to determine the length, assuming I've done a traditional heel flap, but really I guess you can measure with anything. What I do is I flatten the sock out and I measure from the very back. And usually toes take about two inches. I think the pattern in this case said it would take about two inches. Uh, so to decide where to begin the toe, that chart also includes the length of the foot, and I take that length and then I subtract an inch. So I'm putting quite a bit of negative ease in my socks, the socks that I knit, because I've never knit a pair of socks that's too small for someone. Um, so, I mean, knitting is super stretchy. Uh, so in this case, I followed that formula, and I actually, it turned out I was getting more like nine stitches per inch. Stroll is a pretty fine sock yarn. 
I don't know if that's, there we go. And I honestly wouldn't want it in a looser gauge than this. Um, but it still easily stretches to his circumference, because at first I was a little worried, but I, I can put my hand in there and mush it and measure that with my ruler, and they should still fit fine. I plan to knit him another pair of socks for Christmas, so I'll go ahead and ask uh, whether he would change anything about the fit of these. And then, unless I know something special about their heel, I just do a traditional heel flap and gusset, because I found that that fits most people, unless I'm using patterned yarn, and then I don't want to mess up the pattern. And then um, I did a fairly narrow toe because I'm pretty sure my friend's toes taper more than mine do. So, And if not, it'll stretch wider. The other thing that I do when I'm knitting gift socks for people is I pick a pattern that has a lot of stretch in it. So anything rib. In this case, it's a garter stitch rib, which is really nice because that means every other round is just knit. Uh -huh. But yeah, because ribbing just makes it so much easier to fit because it just gives the fabric a lot more, I don't know, ability to conform to different shapes. So the only modification I made to these socks was I did the top cuff ribbing in plain 2x2 two two rib instead of garter stitch rib, which is what the pattern suggests. And that's just because, in my experience, plain ribbing is snugger than garter stitch ribbing. I mean, you can see that's the same stitch count, and it's smaller up here than down here. So, And I like a pretty snug cuff. I use the German Twisted Cast On because it gives a lot of stretch. And yeah, the pattern tells you where you need to just start repeating rounds until you get to your toe. So I did have to repeat quite a few rounds, but I really like how this pattern includes all the way to the toe and also on the heel flap. And hopefully my friend will like them. They're very soft. I wasn't sure how sensitive he was to wool. And then I also know that he he's married to my friend who I have made elephant and seahorse socks for and I know that the elephant socks went through the washer and dryer don't worry they still fit her even though they're made out of 100% wool yarn uh, anyway they did not felt catastrophically apparently they were a little big to begin with so now they fit well and so obviously I figured that having a machine washable and dryable yarn would probably fit better into their laundry cycle I knit hers out of 100% wool because I know that she like hangs up a lot of laundry, so I figured that air drying wouldn't be a problem. Okay, so the discussion about sizing and how I go about knitting socks for other people was an answer to an Instagram question, in case you're wondering. Now I have a sweater to show you that is finished, although I knit most of it last year, so it's not like I just magically knit this in two weeks. This is another gift knit. It's for my sister, and Christmas of 2015, I told her I would knit her a sweater out of this yarn, which is Knit One Crochet Two Cosette, which is a silk cotton blend. And she's very sensitive to wool, and she lives in South Texas, so a wool sweater wouldn't have really fit into her life very well. Um, and I said she could pick the pattern and everything, and she really liked the honeybee lace stitch pattern, but she wanted it to be longer and slouchier. So I ended up mashing up several patterns for this sweater, and I had finished up to here on the body and up to here on the sleeves last summer and then I discovered I had knit both the sleeves way too big and it stressed me out and the weather was starting to cool down so I wanted to knit with wool instead so I put it into hibernation and now I've pulled it out so <laughs> and so all I had to do to finish it was knit the yoke re-knit these sleeves and then do the bands on the front okay so I did a raglan shoulder. I asked my sister, so I knit the sleeves one needle size down than the body because I wanted the stockinette to be a bit firmer, whereas I like the bee lace to be nice and open. And so then I realized that I was going to have to seam the sleeves to the body because, of course, if I join them all together, then I'm only using one needle size to knit. So I asked my sister if she would rather have a raglan or set in sleeve, and once I had sent her photos of what those meant, she opted for the raglan. So I've never done a seamed raglan before. Um, it was quite nice. I prefer knitting in pieces, honestly. I find it much more comfortable. There's less weight on the needles. So, And I was a little worried about seaming it in because 
there were more rows in the sleeve than the body because of the gauge difference. But it turned out to go really easily. All I did was I pinned it first here and then halfway and then a quarter way. So while I was seaming, I could just double check and make sure that I um, was keeping everything lined up well. And the way that I knit the raglan was I used Ann Bud's Handy Book of Sweaters and followed her directions for the six stitches to the inch, size 36 inch bust raglan for just the sleeve, both sleeves. My sister's about a size bigger than me, so that's why I went with the 36 inch bust. And so then, once I knew that the sleeves were the way that they ought to be, I started knitting the fronts of the raglans because that way if I needed to re-knit them, that's way less knitting to pull out since she also wanted a deep v-neck, so very narrow. And I kind of, I did a few decreases there, and then I looked at the length compared to the length of the sleeve and decided how many more rows I had left and did the decreases that way as well. So basically I was knitting the front to make sure that this seam was going to be the same length as the sleeve seam, even if the actual amount of rows was different. So then I started the back, and I did a few rows just... Um, every fourth round and then when I was about a third of the way up I stopped and I counted how many rows these front pieces had taken and I counted how many rows I had already done on the back piece and I had about 40 rows left and I calculated how many decreases I needed to still do by looking at the un and bud recipe for five stitches per inch this time and looking at how many stitches she has left at the top of the back and so then I just divided the number of decreases I still had to do by the number of rows I had left and figured out the formula in order to get those decreases right. So pretty straightforward. It sounds more complicated to explain than it actually is to do. I'm trying to decide if I need to get up and close my blinds. My apartment gets quite a bit of afternoon sun and the clouds have suddenly gone away. Oh, there's the cloud cover again. We'll leave it for now. If it gets too obnoxious, then I will go back. So, yeah, I I had been a bit nervous about how the raglan shaping was going to work out, but it turned out to not be too difficult. The decreasing in pattern was a bit more of a challenge, and I actually did better on the front than the back because the front is what people are going to see more. So on the front, once I had done a couple half bees, I converted to this lace so that there's always something else going on. Whereas on the back, I just didn't mind if there was a bit of stockinette because when you've got the whole sweater out, you don't really notice those stockinette bits. And as I think I said, my sister did not want it to be fully buttoned. And so we decided to just do a clasp at the waist. And that finally arrived this morning. So I was able to sew that on. Hopefully I got the right spot, but luckily my sister is a very accomplished seamstress. So if she needs to sew it on at a slightly different spot, then she can. But there's the clasp. I needed it to be pretty lightweight. And I just think the leaves go well with the bees. The bands are all garter. I'm pretty sure that I chose garter when I started knitting this last summer for the bottom hem because I was a bit daunted at how long she wanted her cardigan. So I thought that garter would make me feel uh, more enheartened about finishing it because garter of course is really simple but I do think that it goes nicely with the overall look of the sweater and um, as I said it's a kind of gradual v-neck I did have some issues because I'm used to having buttons I did the neckband first then I did the button bands and so there was a very nice neat square right here that would have looked great if you were buttoning it but then having the clasp on it looked a little too abrupt so I just went ahead and sewed the extra band and I'll try this on it's not going to fit me the way it will my sister but at least you can see a little bit this lace is very stretchy so that's why I'm not concerned about whether it will fit her or not and there's the clasp so I think it looks really pretty might have to do a clasp sweater of my own it's also very very lightweight I think because even though this is fingering yarn I knit it at a fairly large gauge. Uh, so it took a bit less, 
It took less than five skeins. I think a bit over four skeins. Things that I should look at before I start recording. Hang on. Yeah, so 210 grams or 1,050 yards. So I actually might have enough to knit myself a matching sweater as well if I pull out a finished object that I knit with this yarn that I no longer wear frequently. So I wouldn't do it in the B lace again, though, because, oh, my gosh, that lace is so fiddly. Every few rounds, so that it's a six-row repeat, and two of the six rows are very fiddly, so... Um, I'm pretty sure that I have knit all the bees that I need to for a little bit at least. And I called this my busy sisterhood cardigan because, of course, my sister and I, as well as bees. So but that was a fun time. My sister is very, very excited. When I texted her to tell her that it was done, she said she was literally trembling with excitement. So hopefully she'll like it. She looks wonderful in more drapey, elegant clothes. So, Oh, and then on the sleeves... She requested a little secret bee that's going to sit on her inside wrist. And then I made the cuff extra long so she can turn it back. And it's two by two ribbing. And I used um, basically a tubular cast on, but for two by two ribbing to make it reversible. Like, and still neat. Yeah, so there you have it. I'm really pleased to finally be sending that off. Uh, who knows if she wants another sweater, then that'll be her Christmas gift this year and it'll get done hopefully next summer. But luckily, she does not mind if it takes a while. That's the big project. Finally, and also a gift knit, I have one more pair of socks that I have finished. And these are my, I just called them warm hug socks because they're for my aunt. I knit her a pair of socks last year. Her feet are so skinny. Um, I really need to remember that I made sock blockers, don't I? <laughs> uh, so I made her a pair of socks last year, and so longtime viewers might recall that she has nerve pain in her feet. So I thought it would be really nice to make her a couple more pairs of socks to snuggle in, and she also has just received some more bad health news, and so I thought that sooner rather than later would be a good time. And when I was on the Nitpicks website ordering the yarn for my biologist friend's socks and a pair of socks for my dad, I called my mom to ask if there were any colors in this Nitpicks Felici that she thought my aunt would like, because Felici is the only wool yarn that my aunt can wear, and it's so much more fun knitting with wool. Um, so... While I was talking to my mom, I mentioned that contrast toes and heels would mean that I could get a pair of socks out of one skein. And somehow this resulted in me agreeing to knit two pairs of socks for my aunt and two pairs of socks for my mom. <laughs> so, And one of them will be matching. So I will be making identical socks for my mother, and I'm going to cast those on soon. This is going to be the matching pair. So this is the Captain Nemo colorway. And it's like aquas, blues, and purples. And then this is sea foam is the colorway, and it's in comfy fingering. And then this is also comfy fingering, and it's the blackberry colorway. Comfy fingering is a mainly cotton yarn with a bit of acrylic. And I thought that I would use that for the contrast because, as I said, both my mom and my aunt are very, very sensitive to wool. And so I wasn't sure if straw would be soft enough for them, although I feel it would be soft enough for just about everyone else. But I know Felici has a slightly lower micron count than straw. And especially since cuffs are the part where if I'm wearing socks, if anything is going to itch me, it's going to be on my cuffs. But what I hadn't thought about was, of course, a mainly cotton yarn is not going to have the same memory as a mainly wool yarn. So... I'm not sure if you can tell, but I tried on this sock after I finished the bind off to make sure it would fit over my arch because my aunt and I have roughly the same size feet. And you can see it stretched out a little more than this one. So I'm going to knit my mother a matching set, a matching pair, send them both off and find out how they wear before I knit the other socks and decide whether to do the cuff 
in this comfy fingering, I'm sure the heels and toes will be fine in the cotton. Or whether I need to do it in the Felici instead so that it stays up. So as I said, my aunt has very sensitive feet. So to make the sole slightly more solid so that it wouldn't feel bumpy and irritate her, I knit just the sole on double zeros. And then I knit the top on my usual zeros which zeros are 2.0 metric, and I'm guessing double zeros are 1.75, because it seems like metric moves in 0.25 increments. And I use DPNs, I use four DPNs, so I just had, instead of using four and then a fifth to go around, I had two here and one to go around for those two, and then two here and another one to go around for those two, so I had six needles in my sock holder, which was pretty simple. The double zeros are metal, so it's really easy for me to tell, um, even when I'm knitting while reading, that I need to be switching needles. And for the leg, I just knit entirely on size zero. I went back down to the double zeros for the cuff because I read that if you're going to be knitting with cotton and you want it to behave better for this purpose, have more memory, you should go down a needle size and then do twisted ribs. So I did twisted one by one rib, and then I did my favorite bind off for toe-up socks, and this is the other question from Instagram I'm answering, which is the invisible one-by-one -one rib sewn bind off. So the combination of twisted one-by-one -one rib and then this bind off are my favorites, and it's because it looks so nice and neat and it continues right over. It basically looks like a tubular bind off, but it's simpler to do and it's much stretchier than a tubular bind off, which I would not use on socks. But. It's actually the first bind off that I ever used on my early pairs of socks because I only knit toe up socks at the beginning before I discovered how wonderful cuff down socks are. I knit these toe up so that I could maximize the Felici. But what I hadn't thought about because I mainly knit solid colored socks is that if I wanted a pair with matching stripes, I wasn't going to be able to use the full skein. So these socks took 38 grams of Felici, about 10 grams of the toe and heel color, and about 8 grams of the cuff color. And it's really annoying to me that I have 12 grams left over of the Felici, but luckily my mom has said she doesn't care if her stripes don't match up, and so I'm just going to go ahead and use those extra 12 grams plus the full 50 gram skein on her socks, so they'll be a little taller. But yeah, basically I got to here and the next color was going to be the pink. And I calculated how many grams each stripe was using and realized I wouldn't be able to do another full repeat. Um, so I would have to either stop here or have mismatched stripes. So. For the toe, I did the barn toe from Custom Socks which is the toe-up equivalent of the My Favorite Sock Toes, which are the top-down version that are on Knitty. Um, and I did Judy's Magic Cast On with just eight stitches, which was very fun on double points, sarcasm intended. But I really like the shape of that toe. And my aunt has quite tapered feet, so I think it'll fit well. When I'm increasing on toes, I use a yarn over increase. I do a yarn over on the increase round, and then I knit it through the back loop on the next round. And obviously cotton is less forgiving than um, wool, but I think it still looks good. And the heel is a fish lips kiss heel. I modify it for higher arches because my mom, aunt, and I all have higher arches. So a regular heel flap fits us really well, but if I had done a regular heel flap, then the stripes would not have been the same width because you end up with more stitches, so you run out of yarn more quickly. And so I always do a fish lips heel if I'm doing something like self-striping yarn. So what I do to make it deeper, basically, is first I increased to 30 stitches for the heel, because, um, sorry, I don't think I mentioned this, this is a 56 stitch sock, so if I hadn't increased, then I would have been working the heel over 28 stitches. So I increased to 30 stitches, and then instead of going down to what the pattern suggests, I make it more narrow by just going down to having fewer plain stitches in here. 
The official lipstick seal pattern costs a dollar, so that's why I can't be too particular because it's not free. But essentially, that's what I do. And I know it looks really weird, but it fits really well. My aunt has narrow heels, and my heels also, although they're not quite as narrow as hers, they fill out all the way there. And it just provides more diagonal space right here, which is what you need when you have a higher arch. And yeah, I use the same fitting principles that I already discussed on the other pair of socks. These are not ribbed just because I feel like uh, the stripes would just look best in plain stockinette. And um, I prefer patterned and solid socks, but since Felici doesn't come in solid colors, I'm pretty happy with how these turned out. I sent a photo and my aunt liked them, as did my mom, so I will be passing on my mom's socks here soon. I remembered the other segment that I couldn't remember at the beginning. Uh, I have found a couple mentions of knitting in the books that I've been reading this week, so I thought that I would share them with you. These are both from The Snow Child by Eowyn. Hang on, let me... Yep, Eowyn Ivy. And it came out a few years ago. It's an adaptation of the Snyegushka fairy tale, I guess you would say, about a little girl who is made out of snow. And this is set in Alaska when the U.S. was sending homesteaders and settlers out there. And so it's about an older couple who are childless, and they come into Alaska and... It's not what they expected, and they're not really sure going into another winter if it's going to be right for them or not. And they're both quite sad and disconnected from each other, even though they do love each other. And then what happens when they make a snow child one night and then start seeing a mysterious little girl running around in the woods. So It's a really beautifully written, beautifully told book. I've read it before, uh, but only once. So I, I thought I would reread it because I read a different novel inspired by Russian fairy tales and it was good but it was a little lighter so I wanted something that had a bit more depth and poignancy to it so that's why I decided to pick this one up again. Okay so the first is when they're building this little snow girl and let's see. Jack went toward the barn, Mabel to the cabin. Here they are, she called across the yard when she came back out, mittens and a scarf for the little girl. He returned with a bundle of yellow grass from near the barn. He stuck individual strands into the snow, creating wild yellow hair, and she wrapped the scarf around its neck and placed the mittens on the ends of the birch branches, the red string that joined them across the snow child's back. Her sister had knitted them in red wool, and the scarf was a stitch Mabel had never seen before. Dewdrop lace, her sister called it. Through the broad pattern, Mabel could see white snow. So I thought that was a nice touch. And then the other one is actually about Mabel sewing, not knitting. But I feel like the way Mabel experiences satisfaction from her sewing is the same as many knitters, or at least I myself. It resonated deeply with me. Okay. Following the pattern offered a kind of comfort, a quiet balance to working in the fields during the day. The farm work was coarse, exhausting, and largely a matter of faith. A farmer threw everything he had into the earth, but ultimately it wasn't up to him whether it rained or not. Sewing was different. Mabel knew if she was patient and meticulous, if she carefully followed the lines, took each step as it came, and obeyed the rules, that in the end, when it was turned right side out, it would be just how it was meant to be. A small miracle in itself, and one that life so rarely offered. So. I would definitely recommend that book if you enjoy introspective fiction and obviously if you enjoy fairy tale inspired fiction but I feel like it's more magical realist than straight up fantasy so even if you're not a huge fantasy reader you might still like it for that reason and her new book has just come out I'm waiting to get to the top of the holds list from my library for that now I suppose I will do the yarn review which is going to be a sock yarn I haven't actually knit with that many kinds of yarn, so I'm a bit worried I'm going to run out of yarn to review eventually. Um, but I have knit with more kinds of sock yarn because I learned to knit in order to knit socks. And so there's something that I started knitting from the very beginning. 
And once I knit a few pairs, I decided to start experimenting with different yarn to find my favorite sock yarns. So we are going to be talking about Brown Sheep Wildfoot Sock Yarn, which is a superwash wool nylon blend. And Brown Sheep is a U.S. company, and a lot of their other wool is all U.S. wool. I'm not sure whether the superwashing happened in the U.S. or not here and where the nylon came from. Okay, now I'm gonna have to close the curtains. One moment. Okay, curtains are closed. As I was saying, this is 75% washable wool, is how they describe it, and 25% nylon, and this is the mistletoe colorway, which is a cool sage. The pattern I used is the Kensington sock pattern from the Knitter's Book of Socks, and I love it, it's so pretty. And there's the back. So I wear these socks quite a bit because I think they're really pretty, and, uh, I don't know. I, I have a pair of green ankle boots, so it's nice for me to wear green socks with green ankle boots. So I do wear them quite a bit. However, I do not care for this yarn. This is not going to be one of those glowing yarn reviews. For me, some superwash yarn feels very kind of slippery and smooth, like the Knit Picks Felici and Stroll or Cascade Heritage Silk. And other superwash yarn feels stiff and plasticky and kind of squeaky, like Knit Picks Hawthorn. And to me, Wildfoot falls into the stiff and squeaky category. This did not feel like I was knitting with wool. And of course, this pattern involved a whole lot of twisted stitches. So a lot of stitch manipulation, and it did not, it was not enjoyable to work. Um, it felt like it was squeaking the needles. Isn't this a pretty pattern though? Look at all those details. So, yeah, I did not enjoy knitting with this yarn, and that alone would make me not buy it for future socks, but the plasticky feel kind of continues in the wear. So as I said, even though I wear them quite frequently, I like how they look. They don't itch me or anything, but they definitely don't feel as good as my favorite sock yarns. Um, I do think that this yarn comes in lovely colors, so it's a shame that I don't get along with it better, but those are my reasons. As far as quality goes, I think it's quite good quality. I've worn these quite a bit, and there's just a bit of pilling. This isn't a superwash merino, it's just regular superwash wool, which I'm sure helps it stand up better. My camera doesn't want you to know whether the sock foot has pilled or not. There we go. So as you can see, there is some pilling, but the stitches still all look like, pretty defined. And I think I knit these two years ago. I can check in a minute. There's the heel flap, which is the other place that sees quite a bit of wear for me. And it's not really thinning anywhere. So it's held up pretty well. Let me see. Yes, I knit these in 2015. And I finished them in July. So they've gotten a good two seasons worth of wear and they've held up pretty well. So if you don't share my aversion to certain kinds of superwash yarn, then this might be one that's worth looking into for the nice colors and the whole US company, if that's important to you. But as for myself, I will not be knitting another pair of socks in this yarn. Now for my new segment, which is going to be called Schrodinger's sweater, or whatever future finished object I talk about. And the idea is that I will be talking about a particular 
yarn in my stash and what I could potentially knit from it. And I will be showing you different options, and I would love to hear your feedback. So this isn't necessarily something that I'm going to cast on right away, but it's something that I've been thinking about. So basically, it's an imaginary knitting segment. And I think most of us who enjoy knitting also enjoy kind of thinking about knitting. And the reason why I've named it after Schrodinger is, of course, his famous thought experiment about a cat and whether it could simultaneously be dead and alive in a box before you observed it which I just brushed up on Wikipedia, and he was trying to show the absurdity of certain, of the application of certain quantum theories in physics. But in my mind, and the way that I'm using this, is that when yarn is in stash, it can become anything it wants until you start to interact with it. So I'm sure that actual scientists are horrified, but I'm using it in the pop culture sense, right? That, um, things don't necessarily become definite until there's an observer going on. So, this is going to be a sweater. And let me tell you about the yarn. It's actually two sweater quantities worth of yarn, but it started with this skein, which is a 100 grams of hand-dyed yarn from Sweet Sparrow Yarns in the Moore colorway which is Julie, who I am friends with on Instagram, and she makes the most beautiful colors. And in the beginning, she only offered superwash yarn bases, and I don't buy superwash for myself. So I was telling her that she should really offer a non-superwash base, and when she finally did, I felt that I needed to buy one right away to go ahead and support that. So this is 50% merino, 50% silk, and it's inspired by The Secret Garden with the more colorway. And I just love it. I know I don't buy a lot of variegated yarn, but look, so beautiful. So then there was the question of what to do with it. And I decided it would make a really nice accent color to a sweater that was knit primarily in solids. And I was also watching Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which is a really enjoyable TV adaptation of the excellent book. If you enjoy super nerdy books, you should definitely read this one. There are, are a ton of footnotes to it, and it's great. Uh, my apologies, I had to switch out the battery on my camera. As I was saying, the TV adaptation of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which I watched on Netflix, I don't know if it's still there, but it definitely used to be, includes a lot of green, and that's because green is a color traditionally associated with fairies and fairyland which play a major role in the story. It's set during the Napoleonic Wars, in case you were wondering. And so I was really influenced by that. And then I also just love 18th century fashion. And of course, Napoleonic Wars are early 19th century, so they've already changed to the Empire Regency style. But you still get a bit of that kind of 18th century love of excess, like the chinoiserie, kind of wallpaper and tapestry, and just very decorative. Um, kinds of clothing with a lot going on, and I don't know, that appeals to me. Uh, you know, this is my Kindle cover case. I don't know. I am not the Regency neoclassical white flowing gown type of person. Give me more, more details. So, having watched that and been influenced by all the greens, and then thinking about 18th century bodices with the kind of open tops and something usually like embroidered or some kind of print fabric going on here. I thought it'd be really neat to do an 18th century inspired sweater with this and another green yarn for background. So, oh, uh-oh, my Ziploc bag doesn't want to open. Okay, here we go. So for Christmas, I got five skeins, which is a cardigans quantity for me of Quince and Company Finch and Sage, which is one of the greens that I love. So if you also enjoy cool muted greens that have a hint of silveriness to them, then this is a yarn to look for. Wow, this is, a, I've been talking a lot about greens lately, huh? And so first I was thinking I would do some kind of slip stitch pattern that would have a kind of brocade looking effect. And then I thought, you know, maybe I should do some color work. But 
While I really love these colors together, I also wonder if, especially for color work where you need more contrast, when I get to the sections of green in the variegated yarn, is there still going to be enough contrast? And does this green really bring out the full potential of the yarn? So this has been going on in the back of my head. Meanwhile, I have four skeins of also Quince Finch, which is just their 100% wool fingering line, and Damson, which is this really beautiful purple. And I knit a purple cardigan earlier this year out of Turn and Dusk. And originally, I had planned to use the Dusk in combination with this Damson to make a interpretation of the Jane Seymour cardigan by Alice Starmore that was inspired by sea anemone shells. But when I looked at the Jane Seymour cardigan, the gauge was really tight and I didn't want that tight of a gauge. And it was a very complex looking sweater and I was worried that I wouldn't get a huge amount of wear out of it. And so since I had five skeins of the turn yarn, I decided to just go ahead and knit a sweater in just that purple. And I love that sweater. So I think it was a good decision. But that does leave me with four skeins of this, which is almost a sweater's quantity for me and would definitely be a sweater's quantity if I combined it with this. And I think that just holding up these two yarns, I mean, I think that that purple really lets the full kind of silvery potential of the more, I don't know, it makes it look more silvery to me, whereas when I hold it next to the green, It looks a bit warmer. I don't know. And then also this purple is darker than the green, so I know that if I wanted to do Fair Isle, they would always contrast, no matter what color was going on with the variegated yarn. So that's the first question. Should I use <laughs> the skein of more with the green or the purple yarn? And the nice thing about 18th century clothes, well, one of the aspects of them is that they don't, the bodices didn't have long sleeves, they cut off around the elbow, and so that will affect my uh, yardage usage as well. So I'm not worried about running out of yarn with the four skeins of Damson, if that's what I choose to do. So right now I'm leaning towards this. And I'm leaning towards doing a color work style cardigan instead of a stranded one. Um, just because I haven't done an all over strand egg color works better yet, although I would probably still do the sleeves plain. Maybe not, I don't know. Um, that's why this is full of potential, right? So I have two patterns that are actually both sock patterns that I think would adapt really beautifully into this cardigan. And I already pulled them up on Ravelry, but... So the first one is the Hold Your Seahorses pattern, which is free on Ravelry, and I knit a pair of socks out of it earlier this year, and I love this. This is actually an adaptation of a mitten pattern by, there's the mitten pattern, so also beautiful, and the idea is that this Norwegian designer wanted to use traditional selbu knitting motifs, but put them in a contemporary format, like seahorses, which I think is a really neat idea. Is she Norwegian? Hang on, let me check. Of course it's not going to say. Selbu, of course, is a Norwegian tradition. Um, okay, anyway, we will leave her nationality to be determined. So I really enjoyed knitting that sock pattern. I think it was really beautiful, and this seems like a pretty sea sea creature kind of colorway to me, especially with the deep purple background. So that's option number one. And then option number two is the Nightingale socks pattern, which I was generously gifted. And this looks very 18th century to me. The very, just the beautiful, elaborate uh, bird pattern. <coughs> excuse me, and this has been adapted into a sweater several times. I don't, the seahorse one, if it has been adapted, 
the adaptations have not shown on Ravelry. So let me show you. I'll show you the first sweater adaptation, which has inspired several more. So this is by, her username is Jetshin. And there is the back of her sweater. Oh, isn't that beautiful? And that one is clearly fancier than the seahorse one, although it still involves animals. Apparently, I just want a wardrobe full of animal, bare aisle, or stranded color work. And as I said, I think that that would be very 19th century. And I also feel that since this is a 50% silk, 50% merino yarn, it's quite fancy. And that this could really be a dressy sweater if I opted for that one, whereas the seahorse's one would be a little bit more casual. I don't know. So I've also got some leftover beads that match this colorway quite well. And one of the adaptations of that sweater, uh, she beaded the bands. So if I wanted to go all out, I could add some beads as well. I tend to go all out, let's be honest, when I'm knitting sweaters. So in either case, since I want to make it 18th century style, I'd probably do some kind of peplum at the beginning, and then as I said, shorter sleeves with probably something frilly, because upper class 18th century women were very fond of their lace. If you think about it, lace was entirely made by hand at the time, and I'm sure it took many, many hours of um, work in order to make even a small amount of lace, and so being able to wear it and display it was definitely a conspicuous consumption kind of thing. You could show your wealth on your sleeve. Anyway, so, yeah, and then for the button band, I want to do, in 18th century dresses, they had the laces up the front, or hook and eyes, or some kind of different thing right here, so I think I would do a wider button band than normal, and then I can imagine doing corrugated rib, but instead of doing two by two, I would do one by two, and the two would be the pearl stitches in the background, and the one would be a twisted knit stitch in this color, and so it would look a little bit like corset lacings. So, and I can do that whether I do the seahorse or the bird um, interpretation. But I feel like if I did the seahorses, I would not do as many 18th century details. Perhaps save that for the green sweater, which I would do as a solid. And for the green sweater, thinking about doing a Tyrolean cardigan. But I can talk about that on a different segment because this has gone on long enough. But yeah, so that is my thoughts for potential Imagine Knitting, potential future cast-ons in the next month or two. And let me know if you enjoyed this segment. I, I enjoy doing it, but I enjoy talking about anything to do with knitting. So if you guys um, did not enjoy it, then obviously I don't have to continue it. It was just something that I thought would be fun to try out. <laughs> if any of the physicists are really disturbed by my name, I can change the name to something else. But I think it's really interesting how if you buy yarn for a certain project, unless you cast on right away, over time, kind of your taste or your ideas can morph a bit. And so I love the idea that there are so many different ways that you can use the same yarn to knit into different things. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. Neither of the pets made an appearance. Um, but Thistle is napping on the couch near me, so I can see if she will wake up. Moth is napping on the bed, so I can't reach her today. Yeah, hi Thistle, honey. Here she is. She's entered the long fur phase, and I just think it's so cute that I haven't trimmed her up yet. We are going to go for a walk in the woods here soon, so she will perk up tremendously then. But in the meantime, she's enjoying her afternoon nap. It's been wonderful to see you again. If you would like to keep in touch with me, I am the charm of it on Instagram and Ravelry. And I love receiving comments. It's easiest for me to reply to comments in YouTube or as I mentioned on Instagram. Those are my two main social regions. I tend to use Ravelry more as a functional knitting thing than a social thing. But, um, I hope that you guys have all had a good week and I will see you again soon. Bye.